Good evening. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for attending, and I'd like to, uh, to thank Dr. and Michael here. As uh, tonight is, uh, we will have a, our web our December webinar. Tonight will be on the first two years of scleroderma, presented by Dr. Rofi and uh, Rufi, excuse me. And Michael, uh, we're going to uh, introduce Michael. We will give a bit of a presentation, a little overview of the doctor and of uh, the webinar series. So thank you very much, Michael. I'll uh, let you start. Good day, folks. My name is Michael Bessert, and as a patient advocate for the Scleroderma Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to the Scleroderma Foundation Michigan Chapters web-based 2019 educational series. This webinar is being offered as part of our strategic planning efforts to move towards web-based learning experiences for the next three years to reach more patients, caregivers, and family members who seek to obtain accurate information about scleroderma. There are individuals from all over the world that will access this webinar emphasizing that we can be connected and sit in front of our computers obtaining accurate educational information while staying in our homes and offices. This program made possible in part by an unrestricted educational grant from Actelon Beringer Engelheim, and we want to thank them for their generous support to the scleroderma community. This webinar will focus on scleroderma 101, the first two years of diagnosis. The Michigan chapter and the tri-state chapter will be presenting educational webinars throughout 2020, and you can locate information about them on both of our websites. If you would like more information about these, you can find the information on the national weekly e-blast or on the Michigan and Chapters website, which is all small letters, and Michigan is spelled out, scleroderma.org forward slash Michigan, or the Tri-State Chapters website, which is scleroderma, tristate.org, all small letters. This evening, we have with us Dr. David Rufe. Dr. Rufe is clinical lecturer, lecturer and research fellow in the Division of Rheumatology. He received his medical degree from State University of New York and completed his residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College of the Thomas Jefferson University Christiana Care Health Systems. He completed his fellowship in rheumatology at the University of Michigan in 2019. Dr. Rufe is the newest member to the scleroderma program at the University of Michigan. His clinical interests are in connective tissue disease associated interstitial lung disease and providing transition care for young adults, patients with scleroderma. He will work, be working very closely with Dr. Kana and Dr. Nagaraja on clinical trials in scleroderma and joining the NIH National Institute of Health funded T32 grant. The Michigan chapter welcomes and thanks him for his willingness to present today. Dr. David? Excellent. Thank you for that introduction. I'd like to thank Michael and John for setting this up. And I'd like to thank everybody watching the webinar. I, uh, I'm told that the primary audience is going to be newly diagnosed patients and the uh, relatives and uh, friends of those patients. And today, I thought I'd give an overview of what to expect within the first two years of the disease. Before I start, I just want to let you know how grateful I am that I can be a part of something like this. This is a disease um, It is very challenging. It's challenging for everyone involved, and uh, it's so good to be able to educate our patients. Uh, this is a picture of me, and uh, uh, I'm honored to have done my fellowship at the University of Michigan under the tutelage of Dr. Kana. You can go to the next slide. The, the foundation of what we do at the University of Michigan, and particularly in the scleroderma program, is provide support. Anybody who has been diagnosed with this disease knows that at this time, there is not a cure. We don't want to use that word yet because uh, it would provide an unrealistic expectation of the battle that we have ahead of us. What we do instead is support our patients. We support our patients with listening, with education, with treatment. And over the course of time, we develop 
the relationship that we need so that we can continue that support and patients can help support other patients. Next slide. The core elements of the scleroderma program at the University of Michigan is to provide clinical care with an emphasis on cost-effective outpatient management, outreach to the community for patients and physicians, research into the cause and the mechanisms of this disease so we can better target our therapies. We also provide education to the patients as well as the physicians. This is a rare enough disease where the majority of physicians will not see patients with scleroderma and a handful of patients uh, will be funneled towards places like the University of Michigan. Our job is to help physicians who don't routinely work with patients with scleroderma to have a better sense of how to recognize this in a new case and what to do for patients that have established disease. Next slide. I thought I'd start with a, a brief review of what it means to have scleroderma. I think a lot of this will be a review for our patients, but I think it's fine to see this a second and even a third time. Next slide. Scleroderma literally means, in Greek, hardening skin. You may also see it as scarring of the skin. This is an autoimmune disease. What that means is that the body has inappropriately identified itself as a target for attack. And in this autoimmune disease, the end result is the hardening of the skin. Scleroderma is not synonymous with systemic, <clears throat> excuse me, systemic sclerosis. And we'll focus on this now. Uh, we can go to the next slide. The scleroderma is a, a generalized term for the description of the skin that we see. It can be that the disease is only affecting the skin, and that would be localized scleroderma, or this is a diffuse uh, disease affecting the internal organs, and that would be systemic scleroderma. Now, focusing just on the left side here, patients have localized scleroderma. That means that the autoimmune disease is affecting only the skin, and that can be subclassified into morphia or linear scleroderma. I'm not gonna be talking much about localized scleroderma tonight. I want to focus more on systemic scleroderma. You'll also see this as systemic sclerosis. The subclassification for those patients are going to be limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis and diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis. Next slide. The reason that this disease happens is unclear, but within the last few decades, we have a better idea of the elements of what is going wrong. There appears to be three categories where things are going wrong. The first is autoimmunity. We know there's evidence of autoimmunity in the antibodies that the body is developing. So specifically, when somebody is diagnosed with systemic sclerosis, we check for very specific antibodies in the blood. And some patients will come back positive with an anti-centromere antibody, or they may come back with a positive anti-topoisomerase antibody or anti-SCL70 antibody. And we'll come back to this in more detail. But to know that one key core of this is autoimmunity. The second is vascular injury. The other term for this is vasculopathy. This is different than vasculitis. This is not inflammation of the blood vessel, but rather this is a clamping down from the inside of the blood vessels. And in particular, we see this in the small blood vessels leading to the fingers. We also see this in some of the major large arteries, like the pulmonary artery. The third component is inflammation. And when these three things come together, they inappropriately activate fibroblasts. And those fibroblasts cause a release of extracellular matrix and collagen. What you see at the bottom of the screen are three varying thicknesses of skin biopsies. The one on the left has the least amount of collagen deposition. The one on the right has the most collagen deposition. The one on the right is going to have a thicker skin than the person on the left. Next slide. One of the hallmarks of this disease, systemic sclerosis, is that it is highly variable. We use the term clinical heterogeneity. And what it means is if one person with 
systemic sclerosis meets another person with systemic sclerosis. They may look at each other and say, I don't know that you have the same disease that I have. They do. They just have different manifestations of the disease. This is a disease that can affect different extents of skin, different organs, and to varying severities. Next slide. In general, the way that we classify the disease, systemic sclerosis, is based on the distribution of skin. The person on the left here has cine scleroderma, meaning that there's absolutely no skin thickness. This is very rare, and I'll come back to it in a minute. The two main distinctions are going to be between limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis and diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis. And the thing to notice here is the distribution of skin is different. In limited, you should not have skin thickening that advances closer towards the body than the elbow or closer towards the body than the knee. In the person who has diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, any part of the skin can be involved. Next slide. More specifically, patients with limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis will have systemic sclerosis distal to the limbs and face. These patients will have Raynaud phenomena. And I have to assume that if you've been diagnosed with this disease, you are well familiar with what Raynaud phenomenon is. But that is a clamping down inappropriately of blood vessels in the fingers in response to the cold, and it hurts like heck. Patients will have Raynaud phenomenon for years, for decades, before they go on to be diagnosed with this disease. Now, patients with limited scleroderma, they have a lower frequency of having severe lung fibrosis and less likely to develop severe renal disease. But what that means is there may be a period, 10 or 20 years, where they went without a diagnosis. They finally get diagnosed, and the lung and the kidney doesn't represent a threat in terms of shortening the quantity of their life. But there is a high burden of all the things that make life challenging. We'll go into what those details are in a couple minutes. Next slide. Patients with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, they have skin thickening, and it is proximal or closer towards the body than patients who have limited. These patients will, on the whole, have a shorter duration of Raynaud's phenomenon than patients with limited cutaneous. These patients are more likely to have severe lung disease they're more likely to have severe kidney disease. And within the first several years, specifically the first three, these patients can present with inflammation of the skin and the joints, and it can be very uncomfortable. Next slide. Patients with cine scleroderma are very difficult to diagnose. It may take years before somebody recognizes the constellation of symptoms that brings up to see a rheumatologist. These patients will have Raynaud phenomenon. Somebody may eventually check one of these uh, blood antibodies and it comes back positive and they put the pieces together after some time. We don't have an accurate estimate of how many patients have cine scleroderma, likely because those patients simply do not come to medical attention. Next slide. I'm going to spend a minute talking about the timeline that patients can expect based on the classification we just discussed, limited and diffuse cutaneous system sclerosis. Next slide. <clears throat> As it pertains to these two types of systemic sclerosis, this is a graph that shows the duration of disease. And when we say disease duration, we're talking about the onset being the first non Raynaud's phenomenon. So that means that patients with um, limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis and diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, they may have different number of years for how many uh, years that they've had Raynaud's. But at the time that they develop puffy hands, difficulty making a fist, thickening of the skin of the fingers, that's where that zero mark starts. That's it. Skin thickness is on the y-axis, and the general trend is both diseases progress over the course of time, but they do it differently. Patients with limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis will have a smaller amount of skin thickness. It doesn't develop as rapidly as somebody who has diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, 
And overall, 20 years out, you would see just less skin involvement in somebody who has limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. Next slide. The reason that this distinction becomes important is we have an idea of when to expect internal organ involvement. Now, both forms of the disease will have internal organ involvement, but it will be different severity and at different time points. Strictly speaking, the focus of our talk is the first two years, but it's important to recognize that within the first five years, patients with limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis are likely to develop GI involvement. They also would <clears throat> develop pulmonary disease, typically by five years out. As you approach 15, 20 years, you start getting concerned about things like pulmonary arterial hypertension. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But I want you to have this picture in your mind. If you have limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis, and your question is, what does the future hold for me? We have a general pattern of what to expect. And we tailor our management so that we can identify if these things are happening to you. Next slide. In contrast, patients with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, they have a rapid involvement of skin thickness. Typically within the first two years, you're going to see a lot of development. It will ascend from their fingers, up their elbows, up towards their shoulders. It will involve the chest. It will involve the feet, ascending up towards the knees, and in developing into the thighs. In that period of time, it's very important for us to identify if the person has developed gastrointestinal involvement, pulmonary involvement, heart or pulmonary arterial involvement, and if they've developed kidney involvement. Next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about the disease features. You will be familiar with a lot of the things that I'm saying, but you'll also recognize that you may not have everything that I'm describing. And it goes back to that idea that the disease is marked by clinical heterogene <coughs> heterogeneity. Next slide. So this is a patient who has diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis. So this will not apply to everybody that's watching this. One of the things you can see is a decrease in the oral aperture. This can happen insidiously. It may happen over the course of years. And before you know it, it is difficult to open your mouth to the same degree that you did even a year ago. Next slide. Almost everybody, 99% of patients who have systemic sclerosis will have Raynaud's phenomenon. I usually say that this is a pain in the ass, but it really is a pain in the fingers. And we'll talk more about management in a little bit, but uh, you can recognize in that picture, the person's fingers are really clamped down inappropriately, and the fingers have turned white, and it hurts like heck. Next slide. And this person is demonstrating puffy fingers. Sometimes I ask patients, did you ever develop a period of time when you couldn't make a fist because your hands were so tight. I can tell you that some people who don't have systemic sclerosis would answer yes to that simply because they ate a lot of salt and they had a lot of retention of fluid in their fingers and it would feel a little bit tight. This is different. Patients who have puffy fingers, it is uh, it, it will stop you in your tracks. These hands become big, tight, and it kind of looks like a third grader drew your hand. Next slide. Over the course of time, the puffy fingers and the skin tightness will lead to joint contractures. And here what you see are small joint contractures of the PIP joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints. And you can see those fingers are not going to move. If we try to stretch them out, they just simply won't go. By the time we have a symptom that looks like this, this is typically a more advanced Stage. What we try to do is prevent something like this with constant hand movement, with occupational therapy. Next slide. And here's what we call large joint contractures. And that means the elbow, the knees, the ankles, the joints in this particular patient are not going to move readily. And this is an advanced stage. Once we get to here, it is very difficult to regain the mobility that the person once had. Next slide. So we're gonna go through each organ and talk about its involvement. 
gastrointestinal disease uh, is extraordinarily common in patients who have systemic sclerosis. In fact, I would say, aside from Raynaud's phenomenon, having slowed esophageal motility or having the worst heartburn of your life are the most common symptoms I see. Now, these patients, it can happen subtly, but it becomes substantial. And what it means for this to happen, people will say that they have difficulty swallowing. And it's a little bit more than having some difficulty with dry bread <clears throat> or crackers. Food can get stuck in the esophagus. And the reason that's happening, the very small muscles, the very small nerves that allow for the peristaltic movement, the contraction, release, contraction of the esophagus is impaired. The disease provides too much collagen to that area and those cells get damaged. Ultimately, what happens is that the esophagus becomes a little bit like a pipe. It doesn't contract. It just stays still. And at the bottom of that pipe is the stomach. That re re it, uh, its job is to make hydrochloric acid, stuff that would take paint off of a car. And so if you have bad heartburn, the reason is at the bottom of your esophagus and at the very top of your stomach, all that acid is refluxing into the esophagus, and it hurts like heck. Next slide. Anybody who has systemic sclerosis knows the discomfort of Raynaud's phenomena. So this is almost universal. Patients will develop years before they come to medical attention the onset of sensitivity to the cold that was just different than it was the previous year. And usually I ask, when did you notice things weren't right? And they'll say, Christmas of 1999. They say, how could you be so sure? And they said, because I went outside to take photos with my kids and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't hold the camera. What happens is the blood vessels naturally will clamp down in order to conserve heat that can be lost through the fingers. That's a normal response for your body. In Raynaud's phenomenon, there's an inappropriate contraction of those blood vessels. And in the most delicate areas, at the tips of the fingers, where your job is to be very sensitive so that you have strong tactile sensations, your body is now picking up the discomfort associated with, with what's called ischemia. Ischemia is a simple term. It just means there's an inappropriate amount of blood flow to provide nutrients to the cells of that area. And what happens over the course of time are ulcerations to the fingers. If you don't have the blood flow that goes to the furthest part of your finger and you have a small trauma, you cannot repair those cells, develops into an ulcer, and the worst form of this is a critical digital ischemia, which leads to gangrenous changes of the fingers. Next slide. Lung disease is relatively common. If you have lung disease, it does not necessarily mean that you have a shortened expectancy of life or that you necessarily need immunosuppressive therapy. This is highly variable. The most common type of lung disease we see is NSIP. NSIP, what it stands for doesn't matter, but what it means is this is the pattern of disease that is most common in systemic sclerosis ILD. What we see is at the base of the lungs, there is some fuzziness. The fuzziness, you'll hear the radiologists or the rheumatologists talk about ground glass opacities, and what you see at the base of the lungs, it looks a little bit like if you had taken some glass and ground it up. You can kind of see through it. It's a little bit thick, but it doesn't black out the lung. It doesn't change the architecture of the lung. And what you see is in picture B here, the person is now upside down. You can see that the spine is at the top of the picture and the heart is down towards the bottom. And you see that those ground glass opacities remain even though the person is upside down. And that gives us a good sense that this isn't just the lung kind of shrinking in on itself and becoming a little bit more dense. This person has interstitial lung disease. This person may have shortness of breath and cough. But the thing to know about this person is that the small disease extent of involvement you see here is unlikely to change the quantity of the person's life. Next slide. Compare that to this patient. This patient has a pattern called UIP. Now, strictly speaking, when rheumatologists 
pulmonologists, radiologists. Take a look at patients who have that NSIP pattern and patients who have UIP pattern. It does not matter in terms of that diagnosis, in terms of whether or not they're going to live longer or have more symptoms. So there is no change in mortality based on the type of disease that we see. But what we can see here is that this patient who has UIP pattern, which is less common, has a lot of architectural distortion of the lung. You can see what's called honeycombing. It's called that because it literally looks like a bee's honeycomb. This means that the parenchyma, or the part of the lung whose responsibility is to be very thin, very pliable, to be a single cell thick so that oxygen can get through into the blood, is now distorted. All those areas that look like you would have difficulty breathing through, the person has difficulty breathing through. There is a sister condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And UIP pattern interstitial lung disease looks very similar to that IPF. Next slide. Transitioning to the pulmonary artery. Now, in the office, when I meet with patients, I often try to describe the lung physiology and the cardiac physiology that underlies all this. And my pictures are awful, so I didn't include any pictures here that I drew, but here is a picture of what the pulmonary artery looks like. I want you to imagine in the center of this picture what should have been a perfectly round circle that would represent a major highway going through the United States. If you blocked off the major highway from west to east, you would just see a simple backup. Everybody from the west coast couldn't get to the east coast, and somewhere around Nebraska, there would just be a dead stop. The pulmonary artery is the major highway from the right side of the heart to the lungs. What you should understand from that is the right side of the heart is deoxygenated blood. That means that it has no nutritional value to the rest of the body. It needs to go through the pulmonary artery to get to the lungs to get oxygen. You can see that that perfectly round uh, road is now blocked off. You can say perhaps that's about half as big as it should be. And the reason that happens is that vasculopathy that we talked about, it's happening from the inside of the vessel. It's clamping down inappropriately. This typically does not happen early in the disease. When a patient has this, it is usually long-standing disease. But universally, patients have insidious shortness of breath. This develops over the course of years. And it's hard to explain why it is I'm getting short of breath when last year I wasn't quite like this. Come to see one of us and we say, how long do you think you've had Raynaud's? And how long have you had the thickness of the skin of the fingers? And then we take a look at some of your studies and say, I'm concerned you may have pulmonary arterial hypertension. We need to send you to a cardiologist. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide. Some patients, and typically this will be patients in the early stages of diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, can develop severe kidney disease. There are no other rheumatologic emergencies that parallel this. This is called scleroderma renal crisis. When this happens, this is uh, a medical emergency. We'll talk more at the end what it means uh, in terms of what we have to recognize and what we have to do next. But the symptoms that somebody would experience if they had this developed, and again, particularly in those with early diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, they would have very high blood pressures. If their normal blood pressure was 120 over 80, they'd be at least 150, 160 over 100. The patient will develop dizziness, lightheadedness, chest pain, chest pressure, shortness of breath. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to talk briefly about what it is that rheumatologists do to assess the disease, to know if it's present, and if it's present over the course of time, how is it doing? Next slide. Anybody who's been diagnosed with systemic sclerosis knows that rheumatologists are the skin pinchers. Our job is to put you into a gown and to pinch the skin in 
key areas. And you can see the key areas here. We test the face, the abdomen, the chest, both upper arms, both forearms, both hands, fingers, thighs, legs, and feet. The thickness of the skin, as I showed earlier, is a result of the collagen deposition. And the purpose of what we're doing is trying to get a sense over the course of time, is the skin thickening? Is it staying the same? Or is it getting better? Next slide. For patients who are diagnosed with systemic sclerosis, as a rule, we get an echocardiogram. The reason we get that, even if you don't have symptoms of shortness of breath, our job is to understand where you are now clinically, what does your heart look like? And the reason that this is important, you may go on to develop pulmonary arterial hypertension. We need to know where you started, and we need to know if this is creeping up, because it can happen slowly. So. Uh, if you haven't had an echocardiogram before, it is painless. It is essentially uh, the probe that you would use for a pregnant woman on her belly. You'd put it on the chest, and you'd get a better sense of what the structures inside look like. And in this picture here, what you don't see is the pulmonary artery. What we look for on the echocardiogram are elevated pressures in the right side of the heart. If you had that backup, in the pulmonary artery, your right ventricle, your tricuspid valve, your uh, right atrium, all these things would be backed up inappropriately. And the echocardiogram can estimate how much pressure is there. Now, if that number is concerning, we get that report back and we say, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, I'm concerned that the echocardiogram has showed elevated pressures. But this is a little bit like taking a Polaroid when what you need is a microscope. The answer next is we need to do a little bit of blood work. We need to get an estimate. What is the chance that you actually have this disease? If we think that it's a reasonable diagnosis for you, the next step is a right heart catheterization. I don't show it here, but it's important for you to know that as a screening test, as we monitor to see have you developed pulmonary hypertension, there may come a day when we become concerned and then our next step is to ask for help from a cardiologist or a pulmonologist that does a procedure called a catheterization. And we can talk more about that later, but for right now, important just to know that echocardiogram is a routine screen to assess for pulmonary hypertension. Next slide. About every six months, you should be getting pulmonary function tests, in particular in those who have early disease, within the first five years. Uh, these are a bit of a pain in the butt, but they're not that bad. They give us a lot of information. The reason we get this is to see, has the disease affected the lung? Now, the good news is we get a good estimate to see, should I be worried about the lung? And the other good news is there's no radiation, no harm comes. Uh, the bad news is you have to schedule it, and it's kind of a pain in the butt to do that just before you go to see the rheumatologist. But I can tell you, this is probably the most important screening test that we do. With this information, I get a sense how much of your lung can expand and contract appropriately, how flexible is the tissue, how much do I need to be concerned about pulmonary hypertension versus interstitial lung disease. And this isn't the best measure that we use to see if somebody has interstitial lung disease, but it is absolutely critical over the course of time to look at these trends so that we know, is the person's disease getting worse? Now, specifically, if you've been recently diagnosed with interstitial lung disease as a part of your systemic sclerosis and you're being treated with a medication, the question is going to come, how do we know that the medication is actually doing something for us? You presumably will not feel much if you take the medication or you don't take the medication. The way that we know is that over the course of six months' time, when we recheck our pulmonary function tests, we look to see, has it stabilized the disease? If the numbers suggest that the disease is advancing, we have to consider, is this the right medication for you? Next slide. We get imaging of the lungs only when we have to. 
and there are two times when we have to. The first time we get it is at baseline. When we see patients at the University of Michigan, every patient who has a confirmed case of systemic sclerosis is asked to get a high-resolution chest CT. This is radiation. It is not trivial, but I can tell you that this is not uh, this is not done capriciously. When we ask for this the scan, it gives us a lot of information. It is the gold standard for diagnosing interstitial lung disease. When we get the scan, uh, it isn't difficult to schedule and it doesn't hurt at all. Uh, but we have to wait for the radiologist to give us a read. And sometimes it's a discussion with the radiologist and the rheumatologist and the pulmonologist to understand what is the extent of this lung disease. So if you go to see your, your rheumatologist and your rheumatologist says, it would appear that you have interstitial lung disease. It is not clear to me that you require treatment for your lung disease. You may be scratching your head thinking, if I have the disease, why am I not being treated? And the answer is, the therapies that we have are good but not great. When we see the disease, we treat, if we know that the disease is causing symptom, shortness of breath, cough, impairment in the quality of your life, if it's causing a loss on the pulmonary function tests in terms of the forced vital capacity, the ability of your lungs to be elastic, it's telling me that there's a fibrosis of the lungs. We treat with an immunosuppressant with the goal to retard the, pro the progress of the disease. We don't have a reversal agent. So if your doctor is saying, I'm not going to treat you for your lung disease, it may reflect more that the disease is subclinical. In other words, that this is not causing an impairment to the quality or the quantity of your life. And if we were to give you a medication, it may just give you side effects, increase your risk for an infection. Next slide. Now I'm going to talk a little bit, broadly speaking, about management of the disease. Next slide. Now, let's talk about Raynaud's phenomenon. You see an inverted triangle here. At the top, the majority of patients who have Raynaud's phenomenon will be fine with conventional means. So that would be hand warmers, protective clothing, and of course, knowing what it is that's going to trigger you. It's important to know that if you work outside, that your risk for Raynaud's and bad consequences are just gonna be higher than people who are indoors most days. You have to be prepared. This will not go away. This will not get better on its own. The majority of patients will be fine with those conservative measures, but those who are not, I recommend starting a calcium channel blocker. The names of medications you probably have heard, Norvasc or um, Amlodipine, the other one is Partizan or Diltiazem. These medications can be effective for reducing the severity of the, the flares of the disease. For those patients who continue to have uh, disease despite calcium channel blockers and conservative measures, we can add topical nitrates to the base of the finger for those fingers that are giving us the most problems. And then finally, for patients who have bad disease, it's in several fingers and it's refractory to all the stuff that we've done before, we give medication PDE5 inhibitor uh, is a class of medication, um, sildenafil, tadalafil. This is Viagra or Cialis. Its job is to open up the blood vessels at the very tips of the fingers. And we on the whole, see very good results with this. There are more treatments than what I'm showing here. This is just to show within the first two years, you may be placed on one of these medications. And if one doesn't work, we have other medications which may help. Next slide. Again, the inverted triangle at the top, the majority of patients with systemic sclerosis will have some skin thickness that will impair the mobility of their hands or their wrists. We need to avoid that. And within the first two years, it is absolutely critical that you maintain activity of the hands and the fingers. Because once it freezes up and we get the small joint contraction, it is very difficult to get that back. So all patients should have hand or wrist exercises. 
and especially for those patients with early diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis. For some patients who are unable to do this at home or some patients with worsening disease, I'll send them to occupational therapy. We have an outstanding occupational therapist who works with us at the University of Michigan. If you do not have an occupational therapist that's readily available to you, this person may have somebody who can identify somebody for you. Sometimes what happens is a patient is uh, traveling four or five hours to come to the University of Michigan. It's not realistic for them to drive all the way here for occupational hand therapy. So what we can do in that situation is we can set up somebody close to home and I can have our occupational therapist give that person a call and just discuss some of the basic things that we need to get done. In a rare circumstance, the joint discomfort will become so bad and you may have a fixed joint contracture that medication pain control is necessary, but that is rare. The, the hallmark of what we're trying to do here is to prevent the joint contractures from ever starting in the first place. Next slide. In terms of skin, skin is the measure that we look at the most because we know that this disease affects the skin in a particular pattern. What we know is that the skin will stabilize and it will often soften. And that happens usually after about five years from the onset of disease. This is aided by the medication that we give to retard the thickening of the skin. It happens also as a natural course of the disease. It can be very frustrating in somebody who's just been diagnosed in the first year, wondering how bad is my skin going to get? And the rheumatologist says, I just simply don't know. The more time we spend together, the more information I will have. I wouldn't say that this is a light at the end of the tunnel, but it is important for you to know the road ahead. Typically, five years, we start to see the skin soften. Next slide. In terms of gastrointestinal disease involvement, I would say almost all patients have esophageal reflux disease, and the majority will have dysmotility, meaning that food may get stuck inside the esophagus. All patients should have a gastroenterologist. They should be on a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor. Medication would be something like Prilosec, the little purple pill you'll get at Costco, or Zantac. Every patient with esophageal reflux disease should have a wedge pillow. I often tell my patients, I have no stock in any of the companies that I bring up on a computer when I sit down with them, but this may change how it is that they sleep and how it is that they feel in terms of the chest discomfort and the bad taste in their mouth. You sleep with the wedge pillow rather than a stack of five pillows behind your neck because the wedge pillow is more effective. It's not that expensive. And if you're a side sleeper, there's an option for you where you can snake your arm in through the middle of the wedge pillow. Esophageal reflux disease is a pain in the butt. So the way that we combat it is eating frequent smaller meals. That means that smaller food boluses will go down into the stomach, move ahead, and it's less likely to reflux back into the esophagus. And then if you eat dinner, your job is to change the time you eat dinner. You cannot lay down before three or four hours after your last meal. If you do, that food will be sitting in your esophagus, and the acid that will break down the food will start creeping up into the esophagus. Give yourself that four-hour window, things will get better. Some patients will need a medication to help things move along. In the earlier stages of the disease, those may be more effective than those who have longer-stage fibrosis, where the medication will be less effective. So you should talk to your gastroenterologist about it. Next slide. In terms of lung disease, this is the primary feature that we get concerned for on day number one. Our job is to assess, do you have lung disease? And what is the extent of your lung disease? If the extent of your lung disease is not bad now, do you have risk for progressive lung disease? The reason we spend so much time on this is that it is the single largest cause of disease-related mortality. Now, patients who have this, <clears throat> they may not have clinically significant disease, as I mentioned before, but 
it can be difficult at the first assessment to know that. So the rheumatologist may say, the more I get to know you, the more I can give in terms of information and prognosis. Next slide. What we treat the lung disease with, on the whole, is immunosuppressant therapy. There are medications you may have heard, like Celsept or Cytoxan. We use these medications to retard the progression of the disease. So the win here is not complete reversal of the disease. It's not realistic at this time. We do not have that medication that does that. The win is to say that the forced vital capacity percentage was at 70%. It went down to 60%. And it's been at 60% for the last year. That is a win. There is a new medication. It is not an immunosuppressant. It is an antifibrotic medication. It has been approved for that sister condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And very recently, within the last three months, we have a new medication that is an antifibrotic that has <clears throat> demonstrated benefits in patients with systemic sclerosis interstitial lung disease. It will be important for you to discuss with your rheumatologist and your pulmonologist, is this medication appropriate for you? <clears throat> now, all patients who have pulmonary arterial hypertension or who have interstitial lung disease can have symptoms, should be enrolled in pulmonary rehabilitation. They should have some form of exercise that helps to improve the symptoms and the endurance for that patient. That, of course, may be limited by the patient's inflammatory joint disease or worsening skin thickness. So it really has to be tailored for each patient, but it should be considered for all patients who have shortness of breath related to their lung disease or pulmonary hypertension. Next slide. Now, some patients who have elevated pulmonary pressures on their echocardiogram, again, which is kind of like a Polaroid rather than a microscope, have to have a right heart catheterization. The right heart catheterization is the only means of diagnosing pulmonary arterial hypertension. The right heart works too hard to get blood through the pulmonary artery, which is narrowing. The way that we know is by putting a little probe. It goes in through the groin, snakes up towards the right side of the heart. It goes down into the heart towards the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery gets assessed in terms of a pressure with that probe, and some medication can be injected and we see if the pulmonary artery responds to it. The good news, if you have this condition, within the last two to three decades, there are medications which have demonstrated not only mortality benefits, but morbidity. Give me a, yes, both the way that you feel and the length of your life can be improved with these medications. Next slide. In terms of kidney disease, this is really for patients who have early diffuse cutaneous disease, and specifically those who have an antibody called RNA polymerase 3 antibody. In those patients, they're at increased risk for developing scleroderma renal crisis. There are a handful of things that will trigger a scleroderma renal crisis, one of them being corticosteroids, the most common steroid people use, prednisone. If the dose is above 15 milligrams, we can see increased risk for the development of this, particularly in those with early disease who are RNA polymerase 3 positive. When this happens, this is a medical emergency. Next slide. The patients at the University of Michigan who come in who have early diffuse disease receive this card. Every patient who has RNA polymerase 3 positivity gets this card. This card states, and you keep it in your wallet, I have a, a condition called systemic sclerosis. I am at increased risk for renal crisis. My typical blood pressure is 120 over 80. If you see me come into the emergency department and I have headaches, blurred vision, shortness of breath, confusion, and my blood pressure is very high, greater than 150 over 90, I need to be seen in the emergency department. If you're unable to speak for yourself, this card should speak for you. Next slide. On the back of the card, 
it gives the instructions to the provider. Now, the provider may not be familiar with systemic sclerosis or uh, scleroderma renal crisis. It's not their fault. This is a very rare disease. It is our job to make sure that that person has a general idea of what to do next. So if you carry this card, you come in and you have those symptoms, uh, it gives some basic instructions. There's a medication called an ACE inhibitor. You may know people who, who are on ACE inhibitors for high blood pressure or kidney disease, medication like lisinopril. It can help save the kidneys. It gives the information for the rheumatologist, in this case, Dr. Smith, and the phone number to call. Next slide. I'm going to spend a couple minutes now talking about research, and this becomes the foundation for what it is that we do at the University of Michigan Scleroderma Program. Next slide. These are the members of the, the Scleroderma research team. Next slide. There are four main areas of our research program. First, quality of life research. When we talk about how it is that we improve the course of your journey with this disease, our first step is to understand what is it like for you. And so we have some projects that specifically focus on how your symptoms started and how they develop over the course of time. Next slide. We like to focus also on understanding how it is that we mark success or failure. These are outcome measures. So when a patient is placed on a medication, we need to know, is this medication effective? And if it's not, is it just causing a burden of side effects? The way that we know something is effective is by having a robust outcome measure, meaning that when that number changes, when we see over the course of a year that a particular outcome measure has changed, I can say realistically, this medication has had a benefit. We use outcome measures in our studies for everything hand functioning, skin thickening, lung disease, heart disease. So as a participant in one of our studies, you may be asked, how do you feel? And then another component is, what was your forced vital capacity on your pulmonary function test? Another measure may be, what was the pressure on your echocardiogram? Next slide. The fourth component here is, excuse me, the third component is interventional research. First is asking how are your symptoms. The second is asking how are you, are you developing over the course of time. This one looks to see, is this medication working for you? As you may know, systemic sclerosis is rare enough relative to other autoimmune diseases that medications have not been designed specifically for this disease. We take medications from other diseases like rheumatoid arthritis idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and we use it in patients with systemic sclerosis to see, is this an effective medication? So if you were to be a participant in one of our interventional research trials, it's usually for a medication that has been effective for another disease, and we look to see, is it helpful for our patients? And we measure very closely how it is that you fit on the medication, and it's important for you to know that if you participate in a research trial, it is completely voluntary. If you decide that you do not want to be a part of research or you were interested in research, but then halfway through you don't want to do research, that is fine. It's important for us to talk about this because having such a rare disease, the field will not move forward unless we do something like this. Next slide. The fourth component here, basic and translational research. What this means is we're starting to better understand the biological mechanisms of this disease. We have a good idea of how this is happening. We don't yet understand why this is happening. Our goal is to personalize medicine, is to be able to understand the mechanisms of this disease so we know how to intervene for any given individual. We're not at that stage yet, but in order to move that needle forward, we need programs like basic and translational research to get there. Next slide. In this last section, I'm going to focus on how it is that you connect with us and with each other. Next slide. Selfmanagedscleroderma.com is a good resource not only for patients, but for loved ones of patients. 
I'm going to spend not much time talking about this because I really want you to go to this website, interact, see if these things are helpful for you. My feeling is that you will find something helpful for you no matter where you are in terms of stage of diagnosis or the type of scleroderma that you have. Next slide. We offer a peer mentorship program here at the University of Michigan. You do not have to participate in this, but our feeling is those who have participated in it have had a lot of benefit. What happens is at a large academic institution like this, we have patients coming from far away. It can be isolating to have this disease and not have somebody else to discuss it with. The patients who have gone to our program who are willing to be peer mentors are available for phone, email, or in-person meeting. If you're interested in this, you can go to the website listed here or call the numbers on the right side of the screen. Next slide. If you are interested in research, peer mentorship, or you just have a simple question about something that you saw here, I encourage you to click on this or if you can't click on it, to type it in to your email uh, <clears throat> address, send us a message. We're interested in hearing from you. And then the next slide is our last slide. Oh, looks like we've lost our last slide. Yeah, well, well we had a little bit of a problem, but I'm going to pull up the last slide just one second. Um, <laughs> like I said, the one thing I think is very important that we learned today is that the scleroderma is not a single doctor that basically you will go to. It is a team of doctors that you have to rely upon. And as the as the, the, the Dr. Dave mentioned, is that you have a rheumatologist, you have a cardiologist, you have a pulmonologist, and you have other doctors along the way. And so what that means is it's not one doctor has all your answers. And I will speak from a caregiver's perspective. My, my, my late wife had it for over 20 years. It's important, and I, I'll speak this to the caregivers, it's important that you accompany your, the patient to your doctor's appointment. And the reason why I say that is, is that it's important for you to have four, four ears listening and, to four sets of, of, and two sets of eyes looking at the doctor understanding because as normal, as people is that when we hear news that we don't like, we, uh, we inadvertently shut down. So you want to make sure you have people who, who are there, that you're there with your, your loved ones. What I just brought up now is as the doctor was talking about the University of Michigan um, having uh, some excellent programs for it, I also want to make sure that people understand is that we do have the, na the national convention where we have scleroderma.org, our national organization, and on, on the left-hand side, you, have, you, you see the website. And from there is that our website allows you to find, uh, we have 26 different local chapters in the United States. So there's a lot of information that can be, you know, pertain, that, that can be found uh, w within the national chapter. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, what we have for the Michigan chapter. And as you can see, as Michael had mentioned earlier, help us cultivate awareness and grow our programs in 2020. And one of the things that we, we, we want to make sure is that uh, people understand you're not alone. And like uh, the, Dr. Dave mentioned is that it's frightening, it's scary, it's a new disease. And the last thing you want to do, and, and I'll speak this because I've had a few friends of mine have been diagnosed with scleroderma, you just don't run to the to the internet and look at uh, what it is. You get a definition, but then you look and you see all these different um, websites that at times will give you misinformation. So deal with places that will give you true information on what it is. If you're diagnosed, make sure you start uh, immediately. And all the tests that do Dr. Davis talking about, that's for your benefit and the and the doctor's benefit is that they're establishing a baseline going from this point when you've been diagnosed going forward so they can measure your progression of, of how the disease is affecting you. And so I will say thank you very much, Doctor. That was, a, that, that was very informative, and like I said, 
I've been exposed to, to scleroderma for over 20 years now, so I have a lot of understanding. But I, even today, I picked up a few things that I, I was not aware of. So, Michael, if you would like to uh, uh, close this out, I appreciate it. All righty. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Rufe, for presenting today for the Scleroderma Foundation. Um, I'm glad you brought up the scleroderma self-management. I am a, um, a participant in that, and also the peer mentorship program. I am a peer mentor. So there's just a lot of, of activities and learning and so much at the U of M, but also the other scleroderma centers around the United States. And I've always told and I'm advocating that nobody has to be alone in this disease, that there's somebody there. But once again, I know this information has been beneficial for us all. Thank you for helping to educate the scleroderma community. Thank you also for all you are doing for the scleroderma community. And I look forward to meeting you in person at the U of M in the very uh, near future too. Staying educated about your disease or the diseases that affect the life of your loved one can help you become a more effective healthcare advocate. If you have any questions about anything that has been presented on this webinar, it is best to bring them to your local medical team as they know your specific medical need and can help you make the right decisions. Thank you again for viewing this webinar. Thank you all.